Hello everyone, welcome into a full edition here of Ville on the Ville on my YouTube channel. As I said in that preview, there was just so much to talk about and I'm going to talk kind of low level here. Obviously my voice is very deep, the congestion has got me as it typically does this time of year. So bear with me, I'll probably have to take a drink or two here from all the talking. But there is a lot to get through. I want to start with basketball. On Saturday, the men traveled up to Bloomington, a game I think most of us thought Louisville had a legitimate chance in and that was pretty much... You know, we saw what we thought we might see. Louisville in a game that they had every chance to win, could not get the job done, um, and really it was kind of a tale of two halves, and it sort of played out the opposite of what I thought it would. If you would have gone, you know, before this game, if you just said, look, Louisville's going to play a good half and a not-so-good half, I would have fully have expected that bad half to occur in the first and not in the second, but that is not what happened. The Cardinals came out a very, very encouraging start to that game in what is probably going to be the most hostile environment they play in all season. Again, remember, they don't go to Rupp. They don't go to Duke. So you've got to go to Virginia and Carolina and a few ACC venues. But really, I don't think anything's going to compare to what they saw in Assembly Hall, one of the toughest places to play in all of college basketball. The start was fantastic. That's a very good sign moving forward that they can handle tough environments because that's something they really, I mean, Seton Hall was decent. Give them credit much more than I thought it would be. But I think Assembly Hall is just another level. And I think they passed that test really with flying colors in a first half where, you know, the execution was there. They took care of the ball last week when I said previewing the game. If they want to win it, they're not going to get the free throws. That's exactly what happened. So they got to take care of the ball. They got to take good shots. You saw that in the first half. They worked the ball in and out, had good balance, only two turnovers. And then really that led to why they had the lead. They had a 14 to 10 advantage in the paint. They had a 15 to 6 advantage behind the three point line. And most, most of those three point shots were good looks on kickouts, on rotation. And therefore, a lot, you know, they shot a good percentage of them. And that led to the, having that five point halftime lead that really, if it went for kind of a free throw discrepancy for IU, which again, you expect that in Assembly Hall, that kind of kept the Hoosiers close along with some great play from Romeo Langford. But they had that five point lead. So very encouraged by that first half. And that's kind of what I'm holding on to because of that environment. They came out, a team really still trying to find itself, gradually growing to go into that environment and play that first half the way they did is a very good sign moving forward. But then again, the second half, a little discouraging because what happened there was the offense that you saw in the first half, that balance, the inside, the outside, sort of bogged down. They didn't seem to be as active, didn't move the ball as well, settled for a lot of three-point shots did not make a, as good a percentage simply because they weren't taking good shots. And like I said, if they were going to win this game, they had to play smart, take good shots, and take care of the ball. Nine turnovers in the game, of course, only two in the first half, so they had seven in the second half. So that's a number that got up there a little bit high. And a couple of those turnovers, you remember, just rolled the ball right out of bounds. I mean, that was four points. So it's not only that it's a turnover, you lose a possession, and you give it to IU, when that turnover essentially is just not being able to pick a ball up under your basket where you would have had an uncontested score, that compounds things. So you take those four points from the two bobbles out of bounds, you combine them with a couple possessions IU had in the first half. Louisville played great defense for the entirety of the shot clock. IU chucks up a 30 foot three at the buzzer, hits it. And in the second half, Louisville played great defense, got a deflection, two Louisville guys under the basket. The ball rolls right between them. Goes right to, I think it was Morgan, and he lays the ball in. So that's nine points there from those few plays in a game like this where it's a one-possession game, essentially. That's huge. So that second half didn't take care of the ball as well. The offense bogged down, settled for three-point shots, and that's where this Louisville team still has to grow when they move the ball, when they work the ball, when they pass, when they move, and they take good shots. They're very good. But in this second half, credit IU, they kind of packed it in and kind of just made Louisville take tougher shots lower percentage shots, and it worked for them. I think Louisville a lot of times settled for those three-point shots when they could have found something better, took shots early in the shot clock. I don't mind a good look, but what I want to see first is some motion, some movement of the ball, work the defense. The one shot in particular, Malik Williams, at a, really a kind of a critical point in the game. Louisville had some momentum. I think they built up like a five or six-point lead, had the ball back, came down. I think it was one pass to Malik Williams at the top of the key. They left him open. Oftentimes, as Denny Cromoy said, you're open for a reason. Not that he can't shoot it. He certainly can. But at that point in the shot clock, in that point in the game, having a multi-possession lead, 
having seemingly having control to take that quick three point shot, just not a good decision. That's something you got to learn from because what happened off that miss? IU goes down the other way. Romeo Langford gets a you know kind of secondary transition layup, gets the score, and just like that, it's a one possession game, and that momentum right there kind of started to flip, and that's where IU kind of made their way up and then took the lead, and then of course, you know they won the game. So as a result of that offense getting bogged down. The point paints in the second half, as I said, they had a 14 to 10 first half advantage, 22 to 6 IU advantage in the second half, all because IU did what Louisville didn't. IU moved the ball well in offense, cut well in offense. You saw them repeatedly getting into the lane, getting layups. I only recall one sound, and I tweeted it out when it happened. Ryan McMahon, ironically, was the guy that scored it on a great cut to the basket, got the layup. You saw IU do that repeatedly in the second half. And really, one, maybe two times, you saw that from Louisville. They have to get to where they can trust that offense, run that offense, and get good looks. And if you run the offense, and then you have to do a kick out for a three, that's fine. Because typically, at least the defense is moving, and that three is at least going to be a good look. But settling for threes, especially with a hand in your face, or early in the shot clock, in a game like that, you can't get into a habit of doing that. So hopefully that's something that they will learn from. Again, overall, you can't really be that upset talking about another situation, a good opponent. You saw what they did to Marquette up there at Assembly Hall, and Marquette just continues to win as they knocked off Wisconsin over the weekend. So IU can really embarrass teams at times up there in Assembly Hall now that Archie Miller kind of has things integrated. I know they lost some games last year that were uncharacteristic of them, but they're, but they're sort of getting back to where they want to be. So overall, an encouraging, not really results, but what you saw, you can kind of lean on Moving forward for the Cardinals, next up, Lipscomb. Now, this is the kind of game that worries me. You don't worry about losing a game to IU on the road as long as you're not embarrassed. You don't mind even if they had lost to Seton Hall. But a game like Lipscomb, this is a legitimate team. They've knocked off TCU on the road. They've knocked off SMU on the road. Ironically, their only two losses are both to Belmont, another school that's down there in Nashville. Both of those games by, by one possession. Um, so those two teams kind of know each other. Games that were very similar. Lipscomb had a chance in both of them. But Lipscomb can absolutely play. They just destroyed Navy. Not known David Robinson's not walking through that door, certainly. But to go in and beat Navy 107-81, to they can score the basketball. They've had, I think, four different guys go for 20 or more points. So they've got a rotation of guys that can all fill it up. So this is a legitimate team. You can't afford to drop one of these games now that they've made this progress. They've built that resume. This is a game that you've got to hold on. You've got to hold serve in these games at home, especially as you move towards conference play. They can just take care of these games you expect them to win. It's not going to hurt them. That's why I'm a little concerned because Lipscomb, they've played tough teams. They've played in some road environments. So it's not going to be anything on Wednesday that they're not quite accustomed to yet. So Lipscomb's going to come in expecting to give Louisville a battle. So hopefully Louisville can take care of business in this game and then get through that. Knock a few more out that you expect them to win. Of course, we all know what's coming up on the 29th. For the men, still, the resume looks fantastic. I think everybody, in the grand scheme, we're all happy with where they sit. I don't think any of us expected, like I said last week, if you had told me going into IU that they just had a chance, you'd be happy. And, of course, they had more than a chance. They had that game, let it late, just kind of let it slip away. And that's something you just have to learn from. Moving forward, so the next time you're in that situation, hopefully they can learn to execute a little bit better in the half court, really on both ends of the court. So next up again, Lemscombe on Wednesday night. The women, a good win over a good Kentucky team, 80-75, to a game that, you know, they controlled it much of the way. And as I tweeted out, I was at the game with my kids. You started to get that sense. Now, last year, Louisville handled Kentucky very easily down in Lexington. But the few years before that, Louisville, you would say on paper, was the better team each of those years, yet they lost, I think, three or four in a row to Kentucky in games that all kind of looked the same. Louisville would get out to a double-digit lead, control much of the game, and then in the final, you know, five or ten minutes, just kind of let Kentucky make a run, come back, get them at the wire. I think one of the games went into overtime and they lost. Started to get a sense of that in this game, but it was a fantastic start, really, for both teams. Asia Dirt came out red hot, 15 first quarter points. They led 24 to 19 after a very good first quarter by both squads. And I think what happened was Kentucky style, that's what they played. They had forced 27 turnovers by opponents coming into this game. They were not able to get anywhere close to that against Louisville, but they still played that aggressive defensive style. And I think after Asia Durr's fantastic start, Matthew Mitchell decided, look, we need to ramp up 
that defensive pressure, see if we can get in her head a little bit. They were very physical with her. They bumped her repeatedly, got up into her, and I think they didn't mind getting fouls at that point. I think they wanted to rattle her after the start she had, and I think that's what they did. They sacrificed some fouls. They bumped her, got physical, and I think after that hot start, Asia Durr kind of went into a funk. Yes, she finished with 32 points, but really, though, after 15 in the first quarter, that was kind of spaced out. She shot two air balls in the second half, wide open shots that were air balls, very uncharacteristic, some free throw misses. So credit to Kentucky. You know, they, they decided to go with a game plan, and it worked, at least against Asia Durr, but credit to all the other women on the team who stepped up. Jasmine Jones, terrific play. Sam Furing was great. You know, they reduced the bench. Kylie Shug did not play as much in this game, and I think that had to do with what Kentucky was doing, kind of running at you, pressing, trying to up the tempo, a lot like what you saw from Rick Pitino teams at Louisville. Um, I guess that wasn't just a good fit for her because there was so much up and down. But Asia Durr, I think, got rattled. She left the game at one point. She didn't look physically to have anything wrong with her, maybe an illness. I'm not really sure. Um, but again, despite that, they controlled the game up until really early into the fourth quarter. And then the call, it just really seemed to kind of swing the game. A great alley-oop play from Durr, a great pass to Jasmine Jones. They've run that multiple times this year. The athleticism Jones has is fantastic. She hangs in the air unlike, I'm not trying to be chauvinistic here. You just don't see women hang in the air. She absolutely is a fantastic athlete. She's executed that play beautifully multiple times this year. The alley-oop, she hung in the air, dropped it in. Showed a little bit, a very little bit of excitement after the play. And for whatever reason, an official must not have been paying attention completely because she simply did not do anything to gesture towards the opponent. But the official must have seen something out of the corner of her eye and thought, or his eye, I'm not sure if it was a male or female official, thought it was a, you know, a taunt towards the opponent. It simply was not. It was a terrible technical call. Kentucky got two free throws. They then got the ball and got a three-point play. So just like that, an 18-point lead was 13. And really the entire crowd just kind of sunk them. And I think the team kind of was affected by that. And it's amazing how those little things in basketball can completely flip a game. But it did. If you go back to it, and then Kentucky kind of took that momentum, rode it back, cut that down to, I think, as little as four points late. And the free throws, absolutely a concern. In this game, I don't think it's a concern in the long term because sometimes these things just happen. In a rivalry game, the fact that they went, the numbers were 15 of 28, so barely 50% at the free throw line. And it wasn't just one of the women missing free throws. It was across the board. They struggled knocking down both free throws. I'm having trouble coming up with anyone who was able to hit two on any one trip. Kentucky, on the other hand, was 16 of 19 at the free throw line. So they shot nine fewer free throws and made one more than Louisville. That was a huge factor in this game. If Louisville... They just knocked down free throws at a 70 to 75% clip. This game is not even in question. In fact, Kentucky probably never even makes that run late. And it's an easy win for Louisville. But despite that, they got the win against a very good Kentucky team. I think a solid top 15 Kentucky team. When you give them credit, they're certainly a solid squad. Stay undefeated due to the Louisville women, 10-0 now. They are next up against Northern Kentucky on Saturday morning. At 11.30, they announced that yesterday. I'm like, well, that's, that's awfully early. But it is an 11.30 game there at the KFC Yum Center against Northern Kentucky. But moving forward, the concern there really, I think, is mostly the bench wasn't used quite as much, but I think that had to do mostly with the style Kentucky played. And maybe that wore on them. Maybe that's why those free throws were missed down the stretch for the women. But overall weekend, and as far as the basketball goes, I think encouraging the men, they were so close to getting a huge win that really, I mean, without question, they are ranked this week if they're able to get that win against Indiana. They didn't. I think the resume is still enough to where if they can continue to kind of hold serve here from now until conference play, if their only loss is Kentucky, and to be honest, at this point, I think they're going to be favored against the Wildcats. But regardless of that outcome, I think you're looking at a team that probably could be ranked heading into ACC play if they just don't drop any of those games. Like I said, that Lipscomb game, Coming up on Wednesday, that's a legitimate opponent. Can't overlook a team like that at this point in the season. So hopefully they won't. They will take care of business against the Bisons, which I tweeted that out yesterday talking about Lipscomb. Bison is usually just plural. It's like deer. But for whatever reason on their ESPN thing, it says Bisons. But anyway, that just kind of makes my eye twitch. So now, quick sip here. Moving on to football. The big story really now is 
The staff is starting to round out. Now, not, not a lot of official word has come out yet, but the stories have been leaked out there. I got into this a little bit last week, talking about the staffing for, for Scott Satterfield and the stories that Brian Brown is going to join him as D.C. Frank Potts was O.C. and quarterback coach. He is, you know, the stories are he is going to be coming in as well. And now on Sunday and now into Monday, word that Dwayne Ledford, OL coach at North Carolina State, a very well-regarded well uh, offensive line coach, will be joining Scott Satterfield. They have coached previously. I think he was at App State with Satterfield a few years back. He has had some very good offensive lines. I think I saw a stat, and I apologize. I can't remember where it was specifically. I'd like to give credit when I'm able to. But I believe uh, Ledford's OL at NC State, his entire time there, has given up fewer sacks than Louisville gave up this season. So obviously he knows what he's doing. They've been very impressive. He's up for, I think, multiple awards since he's been there uh, as an assistant at North Carolina State. So when you talk about what Scott Satterfield is putting together, and I mentioned this briefly last week, I think in my Friday quick take, you think about Brian, or Brian, excuse me, Jeff Brom, when he was going to come in here, obviously everybody was excited about it. And many Louisville fans, as the season kind of after Petrina was fired in particular, you start watching Purdue and kind of looking at things. And I think many of us watched that Wisconsin game, and that was all over Twitter. The concern, watching Purdue give up the runs repeatedly, Wisconsin unable to stop them defensively. Everybody expressed concern over Nick Holt. Is he going to join Jeff Brom at Louisville? Boy, are we just going to be a team that has to outscore opponents at times? And I think everybody was kind of willing to live with that because that was the assumption. He followed him from Western, assumed he would follow him to Louisville if Jeff Brom had come here. So that would have been a concern because Nick Holt, great guy, but his defenses haven't been consistently performing at the level you might hope they'd be in the ACC. When you compare that to what Scott Satterfield is doing with his staff, and I really think, like I said, Jeff Brown probably could have come in here and had a more immediate impact with the recruiting, the, the, the reputation he has, the footprint he has in this area, in this region, to be able to flip commits that he had at Purdue to come to Louisville. He could have really impacted things in the first couple of years. But when you start to look at the entirety of the staff, the, the two-plus year window, what Scott Satterfield appears to be putting together is a far more well-rounded staff that's probably going to put a better overall product and have a better overall, you know, long-term, you know, good health with it here with Louisville football. When you talk about Brown and Ponce and Ledford and who knows who else might be joining him. I know Court Dennison's name has been out there. I don't think there's a lot of credence to that just yet that we can get into, but I think the overall staff with Scott Satterfield, you're going to see a much more solid staff, both you know just in terms of their competency and what they're teaching, as well as possibly in the recruiting trail. I think Jeff Brom himself, a very good recruiter, especially in this region, when you talk about guys on Satterfield staff having connections to Florida, having connections in the Southeast, that's very important. That's always been important at Louisville. So I think this is going to be, yes, I'm always looking for the positive, but I, I'm not really kind of sugarcoat it when I say that I think the staff overall is going to be much, much better under Scott Satterfield than it would have been under Jeff Brom. So that's very encouraging. Now, again, nothing as official, but I think with this many you know stories coming out and all these sources with the information, you think that it's pretty solid that Brown, Potts, and Ledford are probably going to be joining Scott Satterfield here at Louisville as that staff sort of comes together. I'm sure by the end of this week, we'll definitely have some solid information. I'm not sure when that New Orleans Bowl was for App State, and maybe once that ends, maybe you'll hear something uh, regarding that. I know it's one of the earlier bowls. I want to finish up with the recruiting angle. I wasn't really going to get into this today until late Sunday. And then in today, a lot of information coming out. On Sunday, you saw a lot of announcements on Twitter from Louisville recruits decommitting, and all of them kind of had a similar theme. It said, after talking with representatives from Louisville. I've decided to reopen my commitment. We'll come to find out the CJ today, Jake Lorham released a story talking about what has gone down and you sort of could have figured it out on Sunday reading those tweets that some conversations were made. The new staff comes in at Louisville, decides they're going to go in another direction and that is indeed what happened. So basically what they're doing is going through looking at what, what Bobby Petrino and his staff had put together for Louisville's recruiting class 
And they made the decision that often is fairly common when you have a coaching change, you're going to move in another direction. It doesn't fit what you want to do, whether you think that athlete just isn't up to the caliber that you want at the ACC level or that athlete, even if they're maybe up to the standards you might want, they don't fit a certain type that you need for the role they're going to play. And really, if that's the case, it's completely unfair to say, hey, come on in here. You're not going to play, but we're going to honor your scholarship. Scott Satterfield has to do what's best for Louisville football. And frankly, that's what he's doing. I get that it sucks. It stinks. It's no good for these kids, especially, <clears throat> excuse me, especially for guys like Jack Randolph, an offensive line commit who was going to enroll early. He had already set that up. He was going to graduate here very soon, if not already, from high school and try and enroll early and get that going. And now he's kind of left, as they say, you know, had the rug pulled out from under him. I get it. That stinks. And I, and I have a lot of empathy for that situation. But in the end, in the long run, it's going to be better off for Jack Randolph that he goes somewhere where he's going to be more utilized and he's going to play a more sound role in a capacity where he can actually have an impact on the team. Because I don't think Jack Randolph, he would have loved to have come to Louisville. But the bottom line is, if he's not going to get used and he's not going to you know, be able to play as much as he'd like to, it's not fair to him. It's not fair to Louisville. So what Louisville is doing, it, it might seem harsh. It might seem difficult but they have to do what is best for the program. And really, by telling these guys now, they're giving them that chance. Now, some say, well, that signing period's coming up. This is an early signing period. Let's remember, this is only the second year you've had this early signing period before the normal one is in February. So they still have a couple months, three months, to, or a little over two months, rather, to, to find another option. And again, I know it's, it's disappointing. And I have, you know, I have empathy for those guys. But Scott Satterfield is not doing anything unusual. He's not being callous. He's not doing something that's just completely unbelievable that's never done before. He's doing what typically is always done when you have a coaching change like this, a philosophy change. You analyze what you have, and you have to make those adjustments that you feel best fit your program. And that's what Scott Satterfield is doing. And unfortunately, when that happens, this, you know, this is just going to happen. It's a normal part of the process. It stinks, but it is what it is. But you know what I really don't want to get into is a situation where we had to deal with it for four years. Matt Colburn was was given the, stat, the shaft by Bobby Petrino when he was asked to gray shirt and sit out a semester and then enroll in January. We got to hear that repeatedly and how Bobby Petrino in Louisville was some kind of just awful program for asking him to do that when it happens on a repeated basis time and time again across all of college football. So I hope that we're not going to continue to hear about this on down the road. This is a normal part of college football recruiting. Does it stink? Yes. Does it suck for the guys who kind of, especially like Jack Randolph, who tried to get things in order? Now he's kind of left with a situation where he's got to find another landing spot. Yes, it stinks. But the bottom line is Louisville's not doing something that many other programs don't do every time there's a coaching change and you have a drastic change in philosophy. And let's not also forget that some of this blame needs to go back on the previous staff, folks, because Scott Satterfield is coming in and looking at this lineup of recruits, and what he's probably seeing is athletes that he does not feel fit, not only his style, but the ACC. So that, again, some of this responsibility goes back on the staff that recruited these guys and told them they wanted them to come in and play at this level. When you look at their offer sheets, the bottom line is most of these guys have no other Power 5 offers. That is telling when that is the situation. That kind of gives you the idea that across the board, many of these athletes really weren't the kind of athlete that Scott Satterfield needs to compete at the ACC, and that's what you saw begin to happen over the past couple of years here at Louisville. If that continued, that slide downward was going to continue. So Scott Satterfield, again, he's doing what is best for Louisville football moving forward, even if that means it's a tough call and a tough thing you have to do to these guys who have previously committed. At least they have a couple months now to hopefully find another landing place, a landing place where they will probably play a much bigger role than they would have if they had been, you know, remained on as a commit at the University of Louisville. But again, that's just kind of all part of it. Um, and moving forward, I hope we can kind of move beyond this. Because again, like I said with the Matt Colburn situation, you know, that was something that really I felt was blown up way beyond what it should have been. And of course, because Louisville played them every year, you repeatedly heard about it. And of course, this year, Matt Colburn had a fantastic game. And of course, again, we heard all about how awful Bobby Petrino was when he asked him to gray shirt and by some accounts, People kept saying pulled his scholarship, when really he just delayed it. He didn't pull it. 
Um, but hopefully this latest situation with recruits, people will let it just kind of go away like it normally would in any other situation when you have a coaching change. Um, but to be honest, I like that. I like that Scott Satterfield is coming in. He's looking and he's saying, I need, you know, we just got a clean slate. We got to get guys in here we feel are going to impact the program positively. And right now I just don't see it from what I see on this sheet of commits. It stinks. But we've got to do what's best for Louisville football. And I think he is starting to do that. But hopefully by the end of the week, we'll kind of get that hashed out. And maybe you'll start to see offers to other guys. But really it looks like this early signing period, what Louisville is doing is kind of wiping the windshield kind of cleaning things up. And it's that second signing period in February that used to be the only signing period where you're probably going to have a lot more guys sign on for the Cardinals. So once again, if you remember, the, the February signing day used to be this huge deal, kind of lost some luster last year. So for Louisville this season, maybe that's going to be a much bigger deal than it was last year because I think a lot more guys are going to sign. I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you for watching this full episode here on YouTube. I do this on occasion where there's more to talk about that I can fit in two minutes. I apologize for the voice. I will be doing official Howard Schnellenberger impersonations here before too long if this doesn't, doesn't improve. But this has been an episode of uh, Ville on the Ville. As always, go Cards.